Adrian Selt is the author of three novels, including End of the World House, Invitation to a Bonfire, which is currently being adapted for TV by AMC, and The Daughters, which won a 2015 Penn Southwest Book Award for Fiction. Her work has appeared in The New York Times, The New Yorker, The O. Henry Prize Stories, Strange Horizons, and elsewhere. And she's also our cartoonist. Adrienne, over to you. Hi, thanks for having me, guys. Um, So I'm just going to read from the beginning, because when you write a time loop novel, it's really hard to choose an excerpt that is uh, representative of that. So I'm going to give you the rest of the setup instead. Um, And by the way, if you sign up for my newsletter, I will pick one uh, winner to get a free copy of End of the World House. And the newsletter also contains, uh, it's mostly cartoons and musings, so it's very low spam content. (laughs) Just fun, weird animals. By the time they reached the Louvre, Bertie and Kate were nearly running. It wasn't unusual for their walks to turn into unplanned races. Both were in the habit of strolling a half step in front of people, and when they were together, this could become a problem. First, Bertie would move in front of Kate, then Kate would pick up her pace to match Bertie's, and so on and so forth, until they looked at each other and broke into a sprint. It had been that way since they were 15, that is, some 15 years ago, and on ordinary days, they both embraced it, competing to reach an imaginary finish line, celebrating whoever won. But today, despite wanting to arrive at the museum on time, their mutual fear of looking un-French was helping them to approach moderation. At the end of the Rue de Rivoli, they slowed down and used each other as mirrors to readjust their outfits. A tug of the shirt when Kate lifted her eyebrow and a twist of the skirt when Bertie sucked her teeth. The morning was hazy, with a fog that wasn't quite willing to resolve into rain, but was heavy enough to sit on the women's hair and dampen their jackets. Kate reached into her bag for an actual mirror, which she used to apply a fresh layer of lipstick. They'd come to the museum at the invitation of a man Kate had met the night before in a bar, and she claimed not to have decided yet whether she wanted to impress him. What are your priorities art-wise, Bertie asked. She had a handkerchief around her neck meant to look chic, but also useful as a breathing filter when they passed through the areas still smoky from the last round of bombs. The tracking app they had poured over on the plane attributed responsibility to a terrorist faction from the suburbs who'd arrived via commuter rail wearing innocuous clothes and backpacks with gunpowder sewn into the lining. Now, Bertie shifted the knot of her handkerchief back to the side into its more fashionable position. Do you want to hear something dumb? I kind of want to see the Mona Lisa. That's not dumb, said Kate. Everyone wants to see the Mona Lisa. I mean, that's why it's dumb. Usually, it's surrounded by a huge crowd, like hundreds of tourists all crammed around this tiny painting, which is probably only an okay painting and which they only like because it's famous. So what, are you going to commune with it now that you're the only one there? This had been the man's offer as they sipped their drinks and watched him glimmer lasciviously private entrance into the museum, which today was technically closed. If she was honest with herself, Bertie had in fact gotten a shiver of pleasure from the idea. I deserve it, she'd thought. If not me, who? But she wasn't about to be quite that honest with Kate, who would only make fun of her. Never mind, she said. We can skip it. I don't care. No, said Kate. We should see it. You're right. She snapped her lipstick shut and stowed it away again. Do you really think people don't like the Mona Lisa? Bertie shrugged. I just don't think most people have really thought about it. They'd come to Paris because the tickets were cheap. First, there'd been a spate of hijackings, and then the bombings, and a period of general unrest. No one was willing to call it a world war, but that was semantics. Now the borders were opening back up under the auspices of a ceasefire, and though most Americans were still too nervous to travel, A few of the tourist boards were giving it the old college try. Kate and Bertie chose Paris because they felt that the French advertisements did the best job of flirting with the overall sense that the world was ending without ever actually stating outright that this might be your last chance for a vacation. Also, Kate was moving in a month, so this was kind of a last hurrah. 
Bertie knew it would have been smarter to put her money and energy into finding a place in the city, finally moving out of the dismal Mountain View apartment she'd only rented to be near Kate. But that would have meant recognizing that Kate was really going to leave. So she'd suggested a trip instead. Anyway, the commute from San Francisco was hellish, more so now that the 101 was gone and the 280 was the only freeway option between the city and the South Bay. It was like God died the day that they shut the 101 for good. People actually cried in the streets. In principle, Bertie was a cartoonist, but for years now she'd made her money doing illustrations for a large tech company in Silicon Valley, one that liked to appear lighthearted and approachable to the public so that they could sell more ads, which worked surprisingly well. Even cynical people seemed reassured by the company's palette of bright colors and its dinosaur avatar, which Bertie had now drawn in a thousand absurd situations, including on a rocket ship and driving a school bus, as well as learning I Think Therefore I Am from René Descartes with a book clutched in its tiny hands. The company paid Bertie more than she felt she was worth, so she drew it any way they wanted, as many times as they wanted, along with a rotating multicultural cast of nameless humans who accompanied the dinosaur on its adventures. Bertie was supposed to be working on a graphic novel, too, on her own time, but these days she rarely had the energy. Not because of her job, so much as the malaise that lay over everything. Politics, global war, world hunger, just everything. Kate had wanted to be an essayist, but that was years ago. She gave it up in favor of directing publicity and fundraising for a nonprofit that lobbied to improve the quality of school lunches. It was theoretically a more selfless career than Bertie's, but Bertie didn't see it that way. After all, Kate liked being in charge. She liked the power. Whereas Bertie was indifferent to her job, which sometimes made her feel like she had less self than anyone. At least if she'd hated it, she could have quit. But nobody wanted to hear you complain about leaving your okay job with good health and health insurance. Not at a time when the U.S. had sudden, suddenly had honest-to-God refugees streaming towards the coasts from the South and the Midwest, finding not much in the way of aid or sympathy. So she kept going every day, sometimes enjoying herself, sometimes spending whole afternoons reading the comment threads at the end of online advice columns, letting rage and disappointment wash all over her in order to reach the rare and blissful moments of catharsis. That morning... The crowd around the glass pyramid in the Cour Napoléon was sparse, just a few tourists taking photographs of the grounds and some Parisians passing through on their way to work. Near the fountain, a mother and her small daughter threw pieces of croissant to the birds, and a few yards behind them, a group of four people was peering at something at the top of a tower, shielding their eyes with their hands. A few days before, when Bertie and Kate had walked by the same court, court, courtyard while heading to the Tuileries Garden, the space had been packed, including a line of museum goers that snaked back half a block. But since the Louvre was closed today, most people had made other plans. The man from the night before had told them he had connections and could get them in for a private viewing if they showed up by 8.45 in the morning and gave his name, Javier, at the entrance. It sounded like a delicious secret, almost too good to be true. They'd found Javier at a jazz club somewhere in the 5th arrondissement an old place stuck in a cellar which boasted a surprisingly good band and a crowd of middle-aged Frenchmen who were eager, eager to dance with youths from abroad and buy them red wine for five euros a glass. The mist turned into a drizzle and Kate took Bertie's hand. Oh, hi, said Bertie. And in answer, Kate gave her hand a squeeze, the same gentle greeting they'd shared for years, but now at a castle in Paris in a light Parisian rain. And I'll leave it there. <laughs>